The Watership Down podcast is intended for listeners who are familiar with the plot. There will be spoilers. This episode is scripted, narrated and edited by Newell Fisher. This week's episode image was painted by Inaka Kalknam, whose Instagram handle is at art.by underscore inner, I-N-E. There will be a link in the notes. It is used with her permission and with my sincere thanks. Hello, and welcome to the Watership Down podcast episode 119, in which I will be considering another angle on the world of Watership Down, one that those science fiction and fantasy fans among you should find intriguing. First though, a couple of bits of burrow keeping. Can I remind you about our appeal to raise funds for the Rabbit Welfare Association and Fund via justgiving.com, the link to which will be in the notes, or just search justgiving.com under my name, Newell Fisher. If you need any further persuasion, allow me to quote from the RWAF website on one of their latest campaigns. Quote, The UK is experiencing the worst rabbit rescue crisis ever. Rescue centres are struggling to cope with the amount of rabbits currently being abandoned, mistreated or surrendered. As the nation's leading rabbit welfare charity, we're launching an urgent appeal for people to support our breeding amnesty and sign our urgent petition to demand government action for a change in legislation to ensure rabbit breeders require the same licensing as dog breeders to raise standards of welfare for rabbits, end quote. There will be a link to the petition in the notes. While we are on the subject, thank you so much to a contributor by the name of Fiverr Bunny, who has made the largest donation yet. Fiverr Bunny says, quote, Best wishes in your fundraising from a member of the Watership Down community and a fan of your podcast. End quote. Welcome to the Alza, Fiverr Bunny. You join all other contributors in being, needless to say, utterly awesome. May your flayra be plentiful and your sylphlay free from disturbance. Also, following last week's section on AI art, I had a suggestion on YouTube that I could have used fan art for free with permission. At the time, this simply did not occur to me, embarrassingly. So to make up for this, I've decided to showcase Watership Down fan art, starting with this week's episode image. Going forward, I have to decide on the details of how I'll go about this, but trust me, this idea now has legs. If you're hearing these words and have produced Watership Down fan art that you would like to give wider exposure, please let me know. I will find a way to use this podcast to promote your talent, again with full credit. I owe my fellow long ears this much. And thank you, based pony Jordi Mario, for this suggestion, which earns you automatic Owsler membership for services to shapes. See the Warren of the Snares for further details. More generally, YouTube views of this podcast are now regularly higher than podcast downloads, so I do plan to start paying a lot more attention to the YouTube comments than I have tended to in the past. They are getting very interesting. And yes, Dalabar, I am looking at you. Your recent comments will appear in future episodes. Welcome also to the Owsler for services to just plain making the honeycomb more interesting. So then, let's explore an alternative universe. The alternative universe of Watership Down. Remember that first shot of Hazel in the 1978 film of Watership Down? the one in which he is portrayed in detail in Among the Undergrowth, his nose twitching and his fur visibly textured. This was done, arguably, because for a few seconds the filmmakers wanted to portray him in the kind of detail they would not be able to sustain with the animation technology available in 1978. And then, having portrayed a rabbit as we know them for just a few seconds, the camera shot dissolves to a view from further away. And he speaks. Let's get pedantic for a while, shall we? I know that isn't like me, but I'll try my best. Rabbits don't talk. There, I said it. And now I must fully accept my expulsion from the tribe of the long ears. But seriously, in this world, our world, we have no evidence whatsoever that rabbits use complex language in the sense that humans use it. Not only that, but their brains simply do not have the structures that are necessary to enable the use of such language, even supposing that they had the physical ability to form words in the way we do. And yes, I know that there is a possibility that some other animals, such as dolphins and whales, may have some form of complex language, but the point is that their brains are comparable in size and structure to ours. The brains of rabbits and most other mammals are not. So, and this was the thought that inspired this episode, 
what would have to be true about the universe in order for rabbits, and indeed other animals, to have that very human ability? We are, as you may have guessed, about to go down another rabbit hole, and it is a very deep one. In fact, rabbits wouldn't have needed human assistance in getting to Australia if they had had one this deep. I am a materialist with no religion. That means that I think my mind exists only as an emergent quality of my physical brain. Destroy that brain and you destroy me as a person, permanently and forever. However, I'm sure that many of you listening to this do not hold the same belief. Which means that you probably believe that you, as a person, in other words your mind, reside in more than just your physical brain. And if that is accepted as a fact, then the mind no longer relies purely on the physical brain for its abilities. Do you see where I'm going with this? Regardless of the truth as to where the mind resides in this universe, it is a necessary aspect of a universe in which animals can use human-like language that their minds do not reside just in a physical brain. And once you grant that premise, suddenly we are in an alternative universe in which the mind of any animal is theoretically capable of anything. This indeed is the supernatural universe in which I have consistently said Watership Down must be set. But there's a problem here. In such a universe, would we not expect to see animals achieving a lot more than they do in Watership Down? We might expect to see them driving cars and using guns, to use two entirely random examples. More of this later. Such a universe would make a complete nonsense of the evolution of human beings. After all, why bother evolving an advanced physical brain if it simply isn't necessary? In fact, it would make a nonsense of evolution full stop if every animal, let's say above a certain size, is capable of possessing a human-like mind. In fact, forget evolution. Such a universe will probably render every world religion that holds humanity to have dominion over animals utterly irrelevant. However, Philip Pullman may have provided us with a solution to this in his Dark Materials trilogy. In the first of his three books, we encounter an alternative universe in which every human has an animal spirit, literally. These animal spirits, or daemons, can be seen by everyone else and can speak. And the consequences of separating a person from their spirit are horrendous. Also in this world, there are talking animals. Well, one that we know of, namely polar bears who speak the same language as humans and are available for hire as mercenaries in their role as armoured bears. Why do I mention this? Well, in the first book, Northern Nights, this extremely different universe from our own is actually remarkably similar to ours. It has the same towns, for example, and many features of the same culture. For example, the British Canal Network. Though in that alternative universe, these canals are the domain of gypsies, or Egyptians as they are called in that universe. Pullman is explicit that the reason for the similarities between the two universes is that his one of real animal spirits and talking polar bears and ours are linked, that they influence one another. Let's put a pin in that idea and come back to the universe of Watership Down. This is a universe in which the world seems to be ostensibly much like our own. Humans have the same role in nature, it seems, that they do in ours, despite the fact that mammals and birds are capable of complex language that easily rivals that used by our species. You really would have thought that in such a universe, the events of films such as Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds, 1963, would have put paid to the human race a long time ago. In such a universe, the ability of animals to use complex communication should surely result in the destruction of any species that attempts to dominate the world in the way we have. And yet it does not. So we come back to Philip Pullman's idea of linked parallel universes. Can I suggest the idea that the universe of Watership Down is one which is so closely linked to our own that the ability of other animals to use their advanced linguistic abilities is severely limited by the capabilities of their non-verbal counterparts in our universe? A universe, for example, in which an intelligent talking rabbit is incapable of counting above four or of grasping the basic physics of understanding that a rabbit caught in a snare just needs to move closer to the peg. If so, what a cursed universe indeed the rabbits of Watership Down occupy. One in which they are capable of metaphysical discussions such as Hazel and Five have at the foot of the down as Hazel recovers from being shot, but in which they are still just as vulnerable to the traps of humans and the predation of other Elil. In this respect it must be said, Richard Adams got the likely mythos of talking rabbits absolutely spot on. 
Elachrera indeed, the prince with a thousand enemies. For that lack of good fortune in life would surely be a major feature of rabbit mythology in such a challenging universe for such intelligent rabbits. Peter Rabbit Undressed Let's come at this from the opposite direction. When you think of the Beatrix Potter character Peter Rabbit, what is the first thing you think of him as doing? I suspect it's raiding over a human vegetable garden. In other words, on wide patrol, looking for flayra. But in our world, this, as far as I can make out, is something rabbits simply do not do. Of course they will eat human-grown vegetables if they get the chance, but such chances are very much subject to the restrictions of evolved behaviour. A rabbit will not travel for miles from an established warren in order to gain a few calories from good quality plant food if doing so expends too many calories and involves too much risk. Do rabbits wander over landscape? Of course they do. But this mainly happens as a result of outskirters, as described in Warship Down, backed up by R.M. Lockley, leaving their marginal position in a large warren and establishing a new warren nearby. But the idea of rabbits with a secure position in an established warren roaming for miles in order to eat some cabbages is a nonsense, at least in our universe. However, in the universe of Watership Down, in which rabbits are capable of discussing abstract concepts such as wasting your time wandering for miles just for a taste of carrot, such an idea makes sense. It is surely the kind of nonsensical activity only an advanced mind with complex language abilities could come up with. In nature, as we know it, animals only engage in energy-wasting activities as a result of courtship behaviour before mating, and rabbits simply don't seem to feel the need for such activities beyond fighting over does. So, we seem to have come across the major difference in behaviour between the non-verbal rabbits of our universe and the verbal rabbits of the universe of Watership Down. Limited though they are by the linkage of their universe to ours, unlike Peter Rabbit, they still take great pride in roaming over long distances just for the pleasure and bragging rights of nibbling on a few human-grown cabbages. Given their position in the multiverse, I can actually sympathise. The rabbits of Watership Down are, indeed, Peter Rabbit undressed, vaguely aware, it seems, of how much more they could be, but with only the blackberries and hazels of that alternative universe having any idea as to how to actually begin going about it. Next time, we begin to look at the first substantial academic work on the 1978 film of Watership Down. Mm -hmm.